I want to thank you all again for coming together for Easter. It is good to be together again. A special joy that Twink Star is here. In just a matter of weeks, maybe months, you're going to be 100 years old, Twink. And you are our hero in so many ways. Welcome. It's good to have you here today. And Ron, thank you for bearing the light today, along with Janice. Thank you for carrying us into this day. I mean that from the heart. There's something in the sanctuary that wasn't here when you, well, it was here when you weren't here. It was placed last year. Deb Anderson finished this absolutely stunning and glorious Easter banner, which you may have seen from a camera view, but here it is, live and in person. So enjoy it. It is a glorious, glorious banner to behold. Let us join together as we come to this time today, the last of the sermons on the Lord's Prayer. I ask us to remember once again that the Lord's Prayer is really a summary of what matters most to Jesus. When we pray this prayer, we're praying what he was passionate about. We're praying uh, this in a way that's very important because Jesus, as we follow him, as we, fo as we believe in him, is the revelation of God's passion in this world. So we're praying what God is passionate about. We're praying for God's dream for this world. So let's step into the final phrase, the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In a letter written shortly before his death, Scottish philosopher Thomas Carlyle described how during a sleepless night he meditated on the Lord's Prayer phrase by phrase. He wrote, I discovered that at every point I was carried out beyond my depth. This could easily describe the experience for most of us in praying, in praying this prayer in particular. As we break it down phrase by phrase, we discover its depth its depth of meaning from, from the Our Father to the holiness of God to the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven to God's will being done to receiving bread for our daily journey to receiving God's forgiveness and in turn forgiving ourselves, forgiving others to being led out of temptation's path while being delivered from the pathway of evil. Each petition carries us beyond our depth into the very realm of God. Thomas Carlyle's words come to life when we're drawn into the final doxology of praise. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This Easter Sunday, as our risen Christ rolls back the boulders of our lives and Man, we've had some big ones in our path, haven't we? And he opens the way to eternal life through his rising from death to life. We ascend a mountaintop of praise for God and God's kingdom and power and glory as it comes to new life in our pathway. We have just passed through a season in which our Savior fasted for 40 days in the desert, in the wilderness overcoming the evil one's tempting, tempting offers to rule the kingdoms of the world, to have all the power that's equal to God, and then to control glory beyond imagination. So the devil had a plan for Jesus, and it was to give him the kingdoms, the power, and the glory. And Jesus rejects each of these temptations along the way and says, it's God alone who reigns over heaven and earth. It's God's kingdom and God's power and God's glory it's not for sale. These business offers of the devil will never be the enterprise of God. So let's look at this phrase, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory of God. Actually, this may surprise some of you, but it comes from outside the Bible, outside the scripture. Although the prayer echoes King David's words, in his farewell prayer in 1 Chronicles 29, 11, he writes, 
Thine, O Lord, is the greatest and, the, and the, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Thine is the kingdom of the Lord, and thou art exalted above it all. Jesus is not quoting David here. This isn't found in the Gospel of Luke. It's not in the earliest manuscripts of Matthew. Modern translations do not include it, though you can read it in biblical footnotes. I know some of you spend hours with the biblical footnotes, and it's down in there. We first see the phrase in the Didache. The Didache is written around 100 AD. I mentioned the Didache a few weeks ago. The Didache was the earliest manual of Christian teaching, which composed, was composed of 16 short chapters, less than 3,000 words. To the early church mothers and fathers, it was the second most important book outside of the Bible. There are biblical literalists who will say that this phrase should not be in the prayer because it does not appear in the Gospels. This may surprise you, but like on most other things that biblical literalists throw my way, I don't agree with them. Sorry, I think they're wrong. I believe, in fact, this phrase should be in the prayer because it was important to the people of the first church, the first church who found that they had to wrap this up somehow, that Jesus had given them all that they needed in the life of faith following him, but it was missing in the prayer. So let's step back in time. Imagine your Christian brothers and sisters in the early second century. They're struggling under the rule of Rome. They are meeting in homes, in caves, in the catacombs of the dead. And the reason they worship there is because none of the Romans who worship all their gods are going to go down in the land of the dead. So the Christians are safe there knowing that we rise from the dead. They worship in hiding for fear of being killed. The Church of Jesus Christ is just a few generations old. It's been about 70 years since the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and they have become increasingly separated from the stories of the believers that first came to them. Thinking back, for Christians in the year 100 AD, Jesus' death and resurrection would have felt like, like Pearl Harbor feels to me and even more to my children and grandchildren. What I mean by that is, it's something I've read about in a book. I certainly heard about it from my parents growing up. I watch it on the History Channel, but it's not my story, right? It's not vivid to me in the same way that it is to you in this room for some of you or to others. Similarly, if you start talking about Elvis as the king to a younger generation, they'll say, oh my gosh, that must be Beyonce's other husband, you know? No, 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 I guess we haven't told you enough about Elvis. <laughs> so, Beyonce already is married. 70 years distance from anything is a long time. Do I get an amen <laughs> from anybody? <laughs> now, now Jesus' prayer passed down through the text and the generations is being given new life in this final phrase. God's kingdom, power, and glory are here and they're coming ahead of us. Future hope becomes this present reality. It's the glory of the resurrected Christ and the kingdom and the power of God in glory. It becomes real and it raises Christ to a new level. No matter the triumphant nature of these words, spoken safely from this nice high pulpit, this big box in the sky in Columbus, Ohio, the truth is Christ is rising right now in places and among people across this globe who have suffered greatly. Some of you know that because you have battled back from the edge of death, having suffered greatly. So you understand what I'm talking about. In spite of everything, you still rise. Across the globe, our sisters and brothers in Christ are lifting up the risen Christ even as they are being torn down by tyrants and terrorists. In Ukraine this morning, our sisters and brothers in Christ are literally fighting for their lives and their homeland against evil embodied by Putin and his oligarchs and a Russian military onslaught which is mass murdering innocent civilians. Still, they rise. Across our country this morning, we have sisters and brothers in Christ 
whose churches have been burned down by arsonists and by forest fires. They have been blown down by tornadoes. They have been washed away by hurricanes and decimated by death from COVID. And still they are undaunted, still they gather, still they rise. Close to home, we as a part of BREAD are working to address right in our community environmental injustice, the need for affordable housing, turning around the increased violence on our city streets and supporting new Americans who come among us. We do this with 44 other Jewish and Christian congregations. We stand together. On May 10th, we'll do that, and I invite everybody here to join us that night. It will be a night in which we will continue to rise. As Ohioans, our battles to contend with are sometimes not far away, like six blocks away. There, down the street at the State House, we're now seeing legislation to abolish language and laws and education and training related to racial discrimination and systemic racism. Called House Bill 327, it does many things, including banning books and teaching methodologies, methodologies around race and ending analysis and care for poor and minority communities in Ohio where we know racial discrepancies exist in the healthcare system, right? According to Jesus, if we're silent, even the rocks will cry out. So let's not be silent. We can't do this. We have to rise together. And then, just in recent weeks, another bill comes along. This bill, 616, commonly referred to as Don't Say Gay, will undo 60 years of progress in LGBTQ plus rights in this state. When one of our members wrote to one of the bill's sponsors in the last couple of days and stated his concerns, the supposed legislative leader mocked our member and put him down for asking questions and raising concerns. So not only have we reached new lows in legislative bills, we've reached new lows that are now matched with legislative behavior. You don't have to do that. You can be civil in your disagreement. If we ever have hopes of attracting great, progressive, forward-thinking businesses and people to Ohio, we can't allow this stuff to take us back before pre-Civil War standards of behavior. We have to turn this around. We can do better, and we must rise. Together, we will rise, and we will stop the madness. See, you can tear people down. You can hit them with bombs. You can hit them with bullets. You can hit them with bills. But guess what? We still rise. We don't lay down and die. We rise because we follow a Savior who calls us to rise. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is teaching us to pray. He's giving us everything he has to live in right relationships. And when we end the prayer acknowledging and celebrating that the kingdom, the power, and the glory all belong to God, we set ourselves on the right path to right relationships with Jesus, with God, and with one another. Thomas Carlyle was right. The Lord's Prayer carries us out beyond our depth. This Easter, it is my hope and my prayer that each of us is carried out beyond our depth as we live fully into the promises we find from God in the Lord's Prayer. Live into holiness. Live into God's will for your life. Receive and share the gift of God's life and offering of daily bread. Receive God's forgiveness and offer it to yourself and to others. Endure and thrive in the midst of temptation's way of tripping you up and be delivered from the grip and the grasp of the evil one. And then, if we are bold enough to speak the prayer out loud that Christ has given us, I pray that we will be bold enough to live it in our hearts to the fullness of God's kingdom, power, and glory that's promised. My friends, I believe that our greatest days are today and tomorrow. So how will the Lord's Prayer in this resurrection joy guide our greatest days today and tomorrow. I pray that this prayer will move us out beyond our depth. And may God bless you 
and may God keep you strong in the faith of our resurrected Lord today and tomorrow. And may the prayer which Jesus rose to sanctify forever be our guide and our strength today and tomorrow. Amen. <laughs>